morning. Good morning. Welcome to our uh, fifth and final Powering Ahead webinar by the Grow Louisiana Coalition for 2020. I'm Mark Earhart, the Executive Director of the Grow Louisiana Coalition. And on behalf of our 110,000 supporters, we want to welcome you to this important event. Uh, today, um, we're going to talk about uh, something that's, that we're all familiar with, which has been the challenges of 2020. But more importantly, we're going to talk about the opportunities that stand before us in 2021. And uh, we have, we're going to be talking about some state issues and where, ways we can get involved with the state. We're also going to hear about federal issues and what may be happening um, as changes come about um, in uh, Washington, D.C. and around the country starting in January. So it's good to have you with us. Um, one of the things that we want to do um, as Grow Louisiana is communicate a message of the importance of the industry in oil and gas to our state's economy, but really, uh, most importantly, to the livelihoods of 250,000 Louisianians um, who work in the industry every day uh, and alongside the industry every day. And what we want to, uh, what we know is that even in a challenging year like 2020, with all the hurdles and ups and downs that we've gone through, uh, Louisiana's oil and gas industry has been at the heart of keeping our state going, of helping our nation get through the difficulties that we've gone through in doing things that are at the very core of how we live every day and how we're going to recover and move forward past the, the challenges and storms and things that we've lived through in 2020 and the recovery that we can have into 2021. And what we have talked a lot about throughout the year and have talked about really for seven years is that Louisiana's oil and gas industry is strong. Um, and as the industry goes, really still is how Louisiana goes. And when Louisiana, um, Louisiana's oil and gas industry does well, our, uh, our state does well and our state's economy does well and thousands upon thousands of families and communities um, do well and our working coast um, grows. And that's what we want to see not only today, but in the years to come. And what we are talking about now is how we can make decisions as a state and as an industry in Louisiana, where other uh, states and other people may be standing still right now waiting to see what might happen. We want to see Louisiana's oil and gas industry grow, and we want to see the state make choices uh, to invest in the industry now um, and in the future of the industry. So while others are standing still, we're building for the future and what the what the future can hold for oil and gas in Louisiana. So today, uh, as we get started, we want to thank our, our partners. Again, we've been doing these webinars focused on different regions of the state uh, since Labor Day. Um, and this this webinar includes participants from all over Louisiana. And we're thankful that we have longtime partners across the state that help us spread the word about the importance of the industry. So we, we do want to thank our longtime partners, the Louisiana Oil and Gas Industry, uh, Louisiana Oil and Gas Association, uh, Louisiana Mid-Continent Oil and Gas Association, as well as the South Central Industry Association, the Gulf Economic Survival Team, and the Chambers of Commerce from the River Region, Lafouche, Homa, Thibodeau, Homa Terrebonne, and Thibodeau. And uh, we thank you for everything that you do, especially down in the Bayou region where our service sector is strong and, and, and throughout Acadiana and Southeast Louisiana, where the industry is making an impact every day. So we're gonna jump into our, our panel today. We have, a, we have two discussions. One is a, is a discussion around state issues and what we can expect and, and be a part of in 2021. And then we'll have a discussion um, with Frank Macarola, uh, uh, from the American Petroleum Institute about what is, trans is transpiring at a federal level that we need to pay attention to. Uh, we encourage everybody, if you have a question as part of our discussion, go ahead and, and click on the Q&A box um, that's part of the screen and submit your question, and we'll, we'll do our best to try and, get, uh, try and get to that question with our panelists and, and as our discussion uh, continues. So. We'll get into our, our panel. So we're, we're very pleased to welcome uh, our, our repeat guest, uh, Representative uh, Jean-Paul Cousin of the 45th District of Louisiana, the House of Representatives in Louisiana. Uh, Representative Cousin, uh, part of his district is Lafayette Parish. Uh, as important, he serves right now as the chairman of the Natural Resources and Environment Committee in the House of Representatives. 
And it's great to have you with us again, Representative. Thank you. Good morning, Mark. Thanks for having me. We also want to introduce a longtime champion of the oil and gas business in, in Louisiana, uh, along with Representative Cousin, Senator Sharon Hewitt of the 1st District. Uh, the 1st Senatorial District of Louisiana includes East St. Tammany Parish, as well as uh, portions of Orleans, St. Bernard, and Plaquemines Parishes. Um, very heavy activities in the oil and gas industry all over Senator Hewitt's district from um, deep water exploration um, and engineering all the way into the downstream end of our business in terms of refining and petrochemical. Um, Senator Hewitt has more than 20 years of experience directly in the oil and gas industry and building her career in the oil and gas industry. Um, she also sits on the Governor's Advisory Commission for the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority and the Select Committee on Coastal Restoration and Flood Control. We want to welcome Senator Hewitt. Thanks for being with us today. Well, you're very welcome. It's great to be here, Mark. So what we'd like to do is, is jump in with a question for both of you, and we'll, we'll start with you, Senator. Um, to get us started, you know, we've, we're seeing maybe the light at the end of uh, the economic tunnel um, when it comes to COVID-19 and, and uh, what we've had to deal with in 2020. And, and those challenges have been well stated and, and are very familiar to all of us. Um, but as we see, the, hopefully, the recovery and rebounding that can take place in 2021, and as we're trying to recover, can you tell us a little bit about what the legislature is doing uh, to work to bring businesses and investments um, back to Louisiana? What can we do to make Louisiana more competitive in the post-COVID world? And, and were you starting with me, Mark? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So, you know, I would say that um, I'm really actually very proud of what our legislature accomplished in the regular session and the two special sessions that we had last year. Um, and I would, during COVID, and I would hold what we accomplished, I would compare that to any other session that we've had in terms of accomplishments. You know, not only did we successfully tackle tort reform, which was uh, something that we had been working towards for a very long time, you know, that helps to reduce the litigious environment that we have in our state. But we also did some things Within three weeks, actually, of the very first case being reported in Louisiana, we filed legislation that was very responsive to the COVID crisis, namely in the area of liability um, legislation that prevents employers from being sued by employees or customers, you know, because of COVID. Uh, we also passed a lot of tax incentive uh, type programs that would help businesses recover very quickly. And so I think that we got out ahead of the, the, the pandemic very quickly in the legislature because we were already in session. And those are some things that many other states are currently struggling to do. The federal government still hasn't passed liability uh, protections for employers. And so, you know, the, that work was, was um, not only in support of the oil and gas industry, but of course all the other industries in our state that are, that are so important to our economy. Thank you. Representative, what do you think? Well, in addition to what you just mentioned, I think one of the most important things that we tackled in the last uh, special session was dealing with the unemployment insurance solvency for the state. And like uh, Senator said, it didn't necessarily only have to do with oil and gas uh, industry, uh, but to all business and, and job creating industries across the state, we suspended um, the solvency tax until 60 days after adjournment of the 2021 session. Had we not done that during this special session, under our current statutory regime, we would have already had to increase the unemployment taxes on businesses across the state in order to make up for the deficiency in the account going below 100 million. So that was an, a very important kind of, um, uh, I think, underappreciated aspect of the, of the special session. Uh, it wasn't the sexiest topic, but I can tell you for the employers that I've talked to that did, did follow what was going on, um, they've been very appreciative of that. Uh, besides that, you know, in this fifth and final uh, session that we're having here today with Powering Ahead, you know, one of my main goals today is a, is a call to action, a call to action to everyone on this call in the industry. Um, 
for the solutions that you're asking us about, because it's not going to really, to me, it doesn't start with the legislature. It starts with the job creators. It talks, it starts with the, 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 the policy experts. So I'm calling out to everybody for technical support, for legal support, uh, and for the support that your coalition needs to push some of these initiatives forward, which we'll get through here in a minute, but it includes the, the, um, tort reform dealing with oil and gas from the coastal lawsuits, um, also from the legacy lawsuit standpoint, which has a little bit different approach to it, uh, and, and any other regulatory issues that, that we might be able to tackle in the meantime, uh, particularly with our orphan well program. So I'm calling out, I'm, I'm somewhat surprised sometimes that I don't get overloaded with ideas. Uh, I do get it from engineers here in Lafayette who have ideas uh, but that we're trying to uh, do our due diligence on. But across the state, I'm asking for the lawyers that represent the large major petrochemical companies and the oil and gas companies. I'm asking for the engineers that are working in-house, for the, for the uh, public policy experts. What are the issues that are going to push our industries forward and attract capital back to the state of Louisiana? So I have a real call to action today. And, and I'm glad you shared that because I think there, there are two issues that we hear about quite a bit when we're talking to people in the industry throughout all over South Louisiana. And, and one of those issues right now is very timely is small and mid-sized businesses that are service businesses into the larger oil and gas industry, as well as businesses that are, um, that are affiliated with the industry, but they may not be as obvious. And, and we've showcased a lot of those, you know, when you have situations where service companies and, and, Larger, larger oil and gas companies are choosing to invest elsewhere or making very tough business decisions. That affects the people who are working for those companies, but it also affects uh, businesses even down to restaurants and realtors. And we have a longtime frame, friend named Tom Spadell of Spadell's Florist in Lafayette, where he said, you know, when the industry does well, his business does well. And so as we think ahead um, in, into 2021, are there things that you have planned um, or that you're thinking about priority-wise that can help uh, small to mid-size uh, industry businesses? And I know you're asking for ideas as well. Um, what can we do to keep those businesses uh, working um, so that they can recover as the industry recovers? Um, that's the first question, and I'll come back to this too. The second question I want to set the stage for both of you is around the coastal lawsuits, because there are things we can do there are things that we can't control as an industry in Louisiana that are beyond our control. They're global in scale. But there are things that we absolutely can control, and that is our legal climate. And as both of you pointed out, um, we got started down that road in 2020. But the, the largest hindrance to the growth of the industry in the state are the, the coastal lawsuits that are short-sighted facing the industry, which is absolutely cooling investment and opportunities for investment. So first, tell us, and Representative, we'll start with you and then go to the Senator. Tell us a little bit about small to mid-sized businesses and service businesses and what you anticipate we can do in 2021. And then we'll spend a couple minutes talking about the lawsuit. Okay, well, back to back to 2020, I think it's important for our, our accounting accountants and our CPAs to make sure that their clients know the changes that were made to the ad valorem tax uh, issues this year so that Avalorum taxes on inventory can be can be counted this year um, for purposes of claiming the tax credit. You know, that's a small gesture. Uh, we still have major manufacturing um, potential here in Louisiana and, and particularly in Lafayette, um, even, with, even with some of the E&P um, reductions across the state and especially here, we still have the, the human resources, the, the warehouses and a lot of the machinery uh, in order to continue manufacturing on a large scale for international operations. But that trickles all the way down to the small mom and pops here in town. You know, uh, 10 years ago, it seemed like everybody had a, a machine shop. Uh, they've been consolidated, but those machine shops are, are, have diversified. They're busy. They're still looking for work. And we have majors that are still moving. Some of the majors in the service industry are still looking at manufacturing uh, in Lafayette as a hub. So we need to continue to tweak those taxes um, and the inventory taxes to attract businesses uh, continuously and to make sure that those changes get communicated uh, you know, across the country so we can show them what we're, what we're made of down here and that we're open for business. Um, as far, and look, and we're relying, like again, as I mentioned, on some of the policy experts in the tax field 
uh, to let us know what, what are those changes, what are those tweaks. We had 70 some odd things on our um, special session call this past session. Uh, many of them resulted in, uh, many of them did not result in any legislation. So we need to revisit that list. There was a lot of effort put towards the uh, economic development side. Let's revisit that list again, see what has a, has a political chance of getting across the finish line that doesn't break the bank and will get signed by the governor, because obviously that's a hurdle, um, and move forward with some of the tax issues, because taxation uh, policy is the main way to, for me to, to attract businesses to the state. From the lawsuit side, uh, you know, we, we made a huge effort, LOGA and LAMOGA, on the coastal lawsuit in the spring uh, that resulted in a um, in, in a resolution being passed, urging and requesting the six parishes in the city of New Orleans to cancel the lawsuit. Uh, however, we didn't get any legislation passed, and that was a result of politics. At the end of the day, the, the entire state does not realize the importance of the oil and gas industry, and that you simply can't squeeze blood out of a turnip. When we're turning away investment, there's no more money coming out of the uh, out, you know out of the royalties and, and end up any of the other um, revenues that we can get out of out of our oil and gas industry. So I think it's just like changing our uh, changing the game plan at halftime of a football game. We have to revisit. You know, wh where are we going to where are we going to go from here? Do we look again at the coastal lawsuits and the procedural issues that we attacked in the spring, or do we come back and look at maybe we look this time at our um, legacy lawsuits and see if there's procedural or regulatory changes? in that statutory framework that we can change that'll bring 500 to 1,000 of the, those lawsuits to a conclusion and put these properties back on the market and start investing back in our land wells as well, in addition to the, in addition to the coastal issues. So the, the legal teams and, uh, have some decisions to make about where we move forward. Um, and from the, poli from the uh, po political side, you know, we've got our work to cut out to um, basically convince our colleagues across the state in some areas uh, like maybe the governor's who doesn't see as much oil and gas op operations, why the oil and gas industry is so important to the state. And in some cases, our revenues for the state have gone from 600 million down to 100 million this year. Uh, and we need to change that. And it's not just macroeconomics. It's not just the price. There are other reasons why uh, companies are not coming to our state. So that's things that, that we can do. Well, and, and I think you raise very good points, and I, I want to bring Senator Hewitt into the discussion because I, I'd like to know what she, uh, Senator, what you see as the biggest barriers to industry's growth and success. In, in particular, you've been very outspoken, as Representative Kusan has, on the coastal lawsuits. And, the, the, and you know, as you all may have seen yesterday, for the eighth year running, Louisiana is in the top five positions of judicial hell holes uh, in the United States. And um, right now, you know, what do you see, Senator, as, as the biggest uh, hindrances to growth for the industry in the state, um, and, and, how, and how do the coastal lawsuits play into that? How is that a priority for you? Well, absolutely. The, the coastal lawsuits and the legacy lawsuits are the single biggest deterrent to investment in oil and gas in our state. And I hear that everywhere I go. When I speak to people, uh, in the business, all around the country, they quickly dismiss Louisiana because we are a judicial hellhole. And we are working to do things to, to correct that. Certainly some of the tort reform work that we began uh, last year helps. Uh, the SCR7 resolution that uh, Chairman Kuzan talked about was a resolution that I authored that, that encourages the coastal parishes uh, to drop the lawsuits and what's interesting about that is that, you know, two of the parishes that are involved in the lawsuits are in my district. You talked about that earlier, Mark, about uh, I have a very oil and gas rich district. And I actually testified with that resolution in front of um, Representative Kuzan's committee with my parish president sitting on the front row behind me testifying against it. And so, you know, I'm willing to stand up. Uh, even when politically it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do, but I know it's the right thing to do for the industry. And these coastal lawsuits and legacy lawsuits are absolutely killing our, our industry. You know, investors can go many places. There are 30 some odd states in the country that have oil and gas activity 
and I have been as an executive uh, in a major oil and gas company, been in that position where we ranked our investment opportunities, there are always more places to invest than you have the dollars to invest in, and they are choosing to go other places. And so the coastal lawsuit issue is very important. You know, um, I suspect that we may have to play a little bit of defense uh, this next session, you know, because those that are pushing and promoting the coastal lawsuits are gonna continue to make runs at the legislature uh, to propose, you know, crazy schemes to try to settle the lawsuits uh, as they did this last year. And we, you know, easily defeated those bills. I think we may see some of those again. Uh, I think we should consider some other version of Representative de Villiers' bill that reduced the severance taxes that was vetoed by the governor. That was good policy. We all know, first of all, Louisiana has the highest severance taxes of any other state in the country. And Representative de Villiers' idea was to, you know, reduce those severance taxes in exchange for encouraging companies to drill or recomplete wells and, and put our people back to work. I think that was a, a great idea. I was very supportive of that. The, uh, Chairman Kuzan's um, call to action, we probably could use more technical support in defending that and helping, to, uh, helping people to understand that people do not have to drill wells in Louisiana. And if you're not drilling, you're dying. And that affects the entire supply chain. When you talk about the service companies, you know, we know the multiplying effect of activity and it starts with the operator, you know, and then it puts everybody else to work. Um, I'm very excited about carbon sequestration. That was something that the industry was supportive of, carbon capture. I passed a bill this last session to do that, you know, where you capture carbon from the atmosphere instead of emitting it into the atmosphere. Those could be refineries, uh, utility companies, condense the gas into a liquid, transport it through our extensive pipeline infrastructure in Louisiana and inject it into a depleted reservoir for storage. You know, Louisiana is in a unique position to lead on that issue uh, across the country and their federal credits encouraging people to participate in that. And so, you know, we've had a number of announcements recently about companies that were interested in doing that and we're working to build the framework to be able to exploit that new business opportunity that again is very parallel to our oil and gas industry. We are going to be the ones that lead in that. And I think that that will help create jobs. And so there may be some additional work that we need to do in 2021 to provide a, a framework for that. Um, I think there's opportunities with the orphan well program. You know, we have something like 4,000 wells, orphan wells, and uh, I know a lot of unemployed oil and gas people that would be very qualified to, uh, to plug those wells and take a, a huge liability off the plate of the state of Louisiana and the industry. And so I've got to believe that there's some creative things that we could do to address that problem and yet create jobs and take uh, advantage of the expertise of the people in the industry. So, you know, it, it's, uh, there are many paths to success. I know that, um, you know, Jean-Paul and I are very committed to supporting this industry, and we want to make sure that it's a viable industry. It's been our state's bread and butter for a very long time. And, uh, it, we certainly don't want to see it die on our watch. And so we're going to be doing everything we can to help support it to move forward. Thank you. And I appreciate all the ideas you shared. We, we did. We have time for one for one question. And uh, about, I'm going to give you 30 seconds each because I, I want to bridge this into what we can do as supporters of the industry to help you accomplish the things that you want to accomplish to make the industry grow. We heard from someone um, who said they've been packaging up and moving customers to Texas and gave us two specific examples and said that the, the, both companies that they were, that the, the, this gentleman was moving to Texas said one of the reasons they were moving is because of the political climate in the state. And the question to both of you, is do we think that this is there's a strategic plan to try and move um, the oil, let the oil and gas industry as we know it go to other states so that we can try and pursue um, wind or turbine power um, in other ways? And I, I, this is something that's been talked about at different times as, as we've been in, in different parts of the state of, well, let's find alternatives and 
We, the oil and gas industry is old. It's antiquated. Um, I think what we miss a lot of the times is oil and gas and the companies that make up the industry are some of the largest investors in, in renewables and, and other types of uh, R&D that takes place. But more importantly, it's the idea of a political climate um, that may be forcing the industry out or wanting to force the industry out, which means that organizations like ours and people who, who are part of the oil and gas business in the state and their families, you know, we need to speak up. And, and let our voice heard, because if we're quiet, this kind of stuff can happen and keep going. Um, and, and by the time we wake up and look and say, where did all the oil and gas business go? It's too late. So do you, I'll pose a question to both of you, and we'll start with Representative Kuzan first. Um, 30 seconds. You know, do you think the political climate exists right now in Louisiana that it that is forcing the industry to, to look in other places in favor of some other types of plans? I think at the end of the day, we still have a tremendous amount of potential and really untapped natural resources in the state of Louisiana that's going to keep the industry here and, and attract upstream, midstream, and downstream industry. The question is, do we have the political wherewithal to have the right strategy and the right, the, the right policy to, to attract the, the capital from around the world to come over here? So the answer I have is, is absolutely yes that we have the political wherewithal and we need the capital to move forward and, and to really power through, uh, you know, it's been a tough term all, you know, from 2015 through now for the oil and gas industry since really since I've been elected. Um, and, and we just need to continue powering through it. Um, this, this severance tax bill that was vetoed, I think the governor was on the cusp of signing it. That was going to be a huge, and I think it's uh, important, like Senator uh, Hewitt said, for for all of the trickle down uh, that could impact all these different businesses. If we can sever, suspend these severance taxes on these particular wells to get this activity going inland in the state of Louisiana, but if we can do that, and it's only five million dollars a year, if we can get that done. That's just the, the uh, one, the first bite at the apple on recovery. We need to start recovering and moving back in the right direction. Um, and the, the businesses that are making those decisions now, they're making those decisions based upon years of history. So it's time for us to start start anew and start fresh and make new changes. Like I said, it's halftime of the football game. We have to change our plays or else they're going to continue making those decisions. But we've got a lot of potential. And then to the to the idea that somehow you know we're shifting away from conventional oil and gas uh, look at the end of the day oil and gas is still is funding for those that are looking for that that um that extra you know benefit to the oil and gas industry the oil and gas industry is funding our mineral revenues make up 33 percent of our coastal restoration authorities budget to the tune of almost 230 million over the last several years so for the majors that are out there that are trying to justify to their stockholders from around the world and in the pensions out of California who are trying to do crazy things, you know, we do have some some justification for continuing to produce oil and gas in this state offshore to assist with the coastal rebuilding of the state, which is going in the right direction, uh, maybe for the first time in history where we're producing more coast than we're, than we're actually taking away. So that's what I would say to the majors. And for those miners, I'm just telling the, the small my mom and pops uh, to, to continue looking at the small things that we're doing. And hopefully it's enough to create jobs and to keep people here in the state. Thanks, Representative. Senator Hewitt, we're going to give you the last word. Give us your final thoughts on where we are with our political climate, but then tell us most importantly what we can do to help both of you. Well, thank, thanks, Mark, and thanks for having us today. This has been a, a fun discussion, and uh, Jean-Paul and I could talk for hours about the industry and, and our support of, of the industry. You know, I'd like to maybe, I want to make sure that everybody hears this message. You know, last year I was invited to, to speak before a House uh, subcommittee in Washington, D.C., as, as an expert on oil and gas and the value of of the industry, both to the federal government and the state of Louisiana. And so that was a very interesting experience. And I was basically in a room with, I was the only pro oil and gas person in the room. 
and it was uh, you know kind of about the Green New Deal and all the different ways they could kill the industry was the the purpose of me being there. So it was like walking into the lion's den. But one thing that I said at that at that meeting, and I'd like for all of our uh, oil and gas friends to hear this, is that the the forecast for the growth in demand for oil and gas is forecasted to grow by 25% by the year 2040. That's from the International Energy Agency's forecast. And that the, that they says, they say that oil and gas will be supplying 50% of the world's energy needs in 2040. So that's 20 years from now. Oil and gas is not going away. We're going to continue. Not only do we provide fuel for the world, but, but we're also, of course, providing all the other things that fossil fuels provide, you know, fertilizer and chemicals and medicines and clothing and plastics. Almost everything that you can think of comes from fossil fuels that cannot be delivered by wind and solar. And although I do agree that the major oil companies are see themselves not as oil and gas companies anymore, but energy companies, and they do have an all of the above strategy. They are investing in wind and solar and, and we have wind and solar companies in my district that I support. I think there is room for all of us uh, to provide energy going forward for, for our, for our state and for our country. And so, you know, I'm, I'm happy to support that. I, again, there's always going to be a need for oil and gas, uh, in our country going forward. Um, you know, I, I, I look forward to that. I've forgotten what the other point that I was going to make, but th this has been, this is an, a very important industry to us. It's got a very bright future. And uh, I look forward to continuing to work with you all. And we are open. Jean Paul and I do need your input on things that we can do going forward that will um, make a difference. You all are closest to the work. You know, I believe that you have the best ideas. And so I'm always available to hear your input. Well, thank you, Senator. Thank you, Representative Kuzan, for, for your time and, and the support you give the industry every day in the work that you do. And uh, we're, we're going to be in touch over the over the coming months, and, and we're going to be standing behind both of you and, and your colleagues as you try to advance the industry in 2021 and beyond. So thank you for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over uh, to Tyler Gray. Uh, Tyler is the president of Louisiana Midcon and Oil and Gas Association, who is going to moderate our discussion with our uh, our guests from the American Petroleum Institute. Tyler, take it away. Well, thank you very much, Mark. I really appreciate the opportunity. To... Uh, I did want, before we got started with the keynote speaker for today, I did want to say and give a special thank you to both Senator Hewitt and uh, Representative J.P. Cousin for all of their tireless work uh, at the Capitol for the oil and gas industry. A lot of their comments today, you were hearing some of their frustrations, but I can tell you from firsthand experience that their work at the Capitol is uh, second to none when it comes to success for the oil and gas industry, and, and a special thank you to them for all that hard work. And second thank you, I'd like to say thank you to uh, Frank Macarola uh, for being with us today. Uh, I'd like to do an introduction of Frank and then give him a couple, uh, some op a couple minutes to give some overviewing and uh, comments, and then we turn it over for a couple of questions. As Mark said in the beginning of this webinar, if you do have questions from the audience, please use the chat function, uh, and we will go ahead and get those questions asked. To start off, first, welcome Frank. Uh, Frank is the Senior Vice President of Policy Economics and Regulatory Affairs for the American Petroleum Institute. He leads a division that includes the upstream, midstream, downstream, and market development segments, as well as the economic policy analysis, regulatory and scientific affairs, and tax and accounting policy. In this role, Frank is responsible for advancing the Institute's public policy priorities and integrating the policy, economic, and re regulatory discipline across API's entire advocacy team. And Today, Frank is going to be here to talk us, to us about what's going on at the federal level and look forward to hearing about your comments. So welcome, Frank. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Um, thanks for the opportunity to be here. As, as, as Tyler noted, I'm, I'm Frank Macchiarola. I lead the Policy, Economics, and Regulatory Affairs Division at API. We're the National Trade Association that represents the full value chain of the oil and gas industry. Um, over the past decade, our industry is responsible for the American energy revolution that in 2019 helped make the U.S. a net 
exporter of energy for the first time in 67 years. So I'm, I'm proud to represent this essential industry and appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all today. Um, I also want to thank Mark and the Grow Louisiana Coalition and Tyler and, and Lamoga uh, for the good work that, that they do. Um, it's, uh, it's absolutely essential to have uh, coalition partners as we engage in these issues. Um, and so it's uh, terrific uh, both to be here and to, to work with these groups uh, throughout the years um, in both of our teams. Energy is at the foundation of Louisiana's economy and, it, and its way of life. You heard about it uh, just just now. Um, the Senator Hewitt put it uh, better than I can about the value of oil and gas, not just to the nation, um, but to Louisiana. But a few a few facts to consider. So in, in 2018, the oil and natural gas and petrochemical industries provided 128,000 direct jobs in Louisiana. And the industry's added a total value of $78.3 billion to the state economy. In 2019, oil and gas accounted for $4.5 billion in state and tax local revenues, and almost 15% of total taxes, licenses, and fees collected in Louisiana came from the industry. I recognize that you all are reaching uh, peak Zoom fatigue uh, none of us could have imagined that we'd be um, doing virtual presentations nine months into the into this pandemic. In fact, it's it's hard to believe that nine months ago our industry faced a steep and steady commodity to price uh, commodity price decline, um, combined with the conditions of oversupply that existed, um, as well as really the swiftest demand decline that the industry has ever seen. These events changed our country and our industry seemingly overnight. We've all had a feeling that our nation would be going through a difficult time, but little did we know the challenges that our industry would face and continue to face. With Louisiana as the number two producer of oil and the number four producer of natural gas in the US, you all know firsthand the challenges that America's energy industry continues to face. But I'm also certain that our industry is, is one that bounces back. We have throughout our history. Um, and as the, as the Senator noted, we're gonna continue to need this essential uh, product to continue to power our lives. We're an industry of entrepreneurs and innovators, and we will be on a path to recovery. But just as we're starting on a path to recovery, we face a new policy threat. And I wanna talk just briefly about that threat, which is a potential ban on leasing of oil and gas on federal lands and waters. The potential federal ban on leasing develop and development would have significant negative impacts on our, on our energy security, but would acutely impact our industry and the people of the state of Louisiana. First, it's important to note that in 2019, federal lands accounted for 22% of total U.S. oil production and 12% of total U.S. natural gas production. Our industry provided more than $10 billion in federal revenues in fiscal year 2018 alone. At no time, but especially in this time of great economic dislocation, can we afford to lose billions of dollars in revenues to the federal government? When the Biden campaign first released this proposal during the summer, as part of their commitment to fight climate change, API immediately did research and analysis to project the impacts of such a ban and communicate those impacts to the public, to policymakers, and to our industry allies. We examined the effects of this leasing ban on three areas, energy security, economic indicators, and the environment. We found first that a federal ban on oil and gas leasing would harm our nation's energy security. Specifically, we estimate that this ban could increase imports from foreign sources of oil by 2 million barrels per day by 2030. It would also decrease offshore oil and natural gas production by 44% for oil and 68% for natural gas 
in 2030. Second, a federal ban on oil and gas leasing would severely harm our local, state, and national economies at the worst possible time. We see the potential for a cumulative effect of $700 billion in the negative on GDP loss and job loss of up to 1 million, including 50,000 jobs in the state of Louisiana. And third, a federal ban on oil and gas leasing would actually reverse the, pro the progress we've made on environmental outcomes, specifically the decline in natural gas production as a result of this ban would mean 31 gigawatts of coal capacity would not retire and it would increase coal generation by 15% over the base case in 2030, representing about a 5.5% increase in CO2 emissions. So what starts as an objective to reduce emissions ends up increasing emissions, reducing jobs, increasing our dependence on foreign oil, and cutting our GDP. As you all know, and as our study found, a ban on federal leasing would do nothing to help our nation's energy security, and it would not address the challenge of climate change. We all recognize that the people knew, that know how to address these challenges, as you've heard from the two speakers today, those folks are in the oil and gas industry. They're innovators um, within our industry whose innovation and technological advances brought us jobs, economic prosperity, and environmental progress. At API, along with our partner trade associations, we're going to work hard to fight this policy every step of the way at the federal level. In fact, our CEO, Mike Summers, recently told Reuters that API would use every tool at its disposal if the incoming administration tries to res restrict development on federal lands. The road ahead will be a bumpy one, but we believe the long-term outlook remains strong for our industry. The world population is still on pace to grow by 2 billion people over the next generation, and energy consumption will increase by 50%. And as you heard the Senator note earlier, it, the principal portion of that energy will come from oil and natural gas to help lift people uh, to prosperity and into the middle class. The world will need this energy and all independent experts agree that our industry will remain a principal source. We're poised to deliver and API is here to advocate on behalf of this essential oil and gas industry. I'm happy to take any questions regarding this leasing ban or any other federal policies uh, that you'd like. I'll turn it back to you, Tyler. Thank you. Well, thank you, Frank appreciate all of those comments. It, you really did a great job of capturing the economic impact and what a big deal the oil and natural gas industry is. And so you mentioned a couple of things that I know are very important to Louisiana, and I think it's important to uh, reflect on them a little bit as we have this conversation. Uh, the OCS leasing ban, where that conversation comes, um, because when we talk about coastal revenues for the state, which is an important uh, aspect of the state's economy, coastal restoration, that comes from leasing, right? That comes from Gulf of Mexico Econo uh, Energy Security Act, Go, Mes Go Mesa revenues. So if we don't have leasing, you don't have that coastal aspect of it. And then the second thing that I think you really touched in is talking about COVID-19 and how that dropped that demand, right, for liquid fuels, which has resulted in a situation specifically in Louisiana um, compared to our colleagues in Texas, you have the Gulf Coast producing about 50% of the nation's fuel, right? With Louisiana and Texas being a big part of that. What are things that we can do from two different levels? One, um, as the Biden administration transitions in, how can we communicate with our colleagues, whether it's elected officials or whatnot, how important the OCS leasing ban is and what it does to us directly in Louisiana? And the second piece is, what can we do to help recover for the oil and natural gas industry, how can we help that demand get back up? Yeah, the great question, Tyler. So, I, I mean, for, first off, you know, this really shouldn't be a, um, really shouldn't be a political uh, discussion or a or a sort of a geographic discussion. I mean, for, first, the first thing we need to 
spinner is that these are federal lands for everyone. And we've been leasing on these lands for decades for the benefit of not just the areas in which we're producing oil and gas, but for the benefit of the entire nation. So we share on onshore, we share 50% of revenues. Uh, the OCS, uh, the, the Go Mesa bill through the uh, amending the OCSLA has a formula in which we share revenues that go both to go to the states, the federal government, the Land and Water Conservation Fund. These are important uh, revenue dollars that go to everybody around the country. Uh, I remember this debate in the Senate, and it was it was a bipartisan one. It had support not just of the Gulf Coast members. It had re support for Republican members. It had report support of Democratic members. It even brought the folks from Florida who were concerned about offshore production to the table to negotiate a deal um, because they recognize that this is an important asset, not just to Louisiana, but to the whole country. And I think what our study outlines is the damaging effects that this would that, that a ban would have, um, you know, from an economic standpoint, an employment standpoint, um, and from a from a national security standpoint. And again, as I noted, just at a time when we're re you know, you've, you've heard politicians over all these years talk about energy independence, just as a time that we're reaching the point where we're becoming um, a net exporter of energy we're going to turn our back on the resources that we have in the United States. It makes no sense. Um, with respect to your question about demand, uh, we've sort of said from the outset, Tyler, that demand is going to come back. Uh, well, first off, demand has ticked up quite remarkably given the condition that we're in, both from an economic standpoint and from a, the, um, the unique circumstance of COVID-19 on, you know, lockdown policies. Typically, you'll see demand drop when you're having economic contraction. We had sort of forced economic contraction as a result of a pandemic. So it was sort of a, and on top of that, as I noted at the top, um, a, an over, a conditions of oversupply that existed at the start. Um, so we've, we've, we've come a long way in working that out and in kind of rebalancing the marketplace. But I think the question for your question is a good one. The real question is, when do we make up what's now a small delta between demand pre-pandemic and where we are today? When does that happen? And, you know, and, and how does it happen? And I think really it happens through continued economic growth a recovery out of the COVID crisis. Um, and then um, sort of anybody's guess, but we do appear to be on the path to um, to a second half of 2021 that looks quite different because of the distribution of vaccines. Um, you know, a lot of estimates out there uh, that, are caught, that are predicting uh, strong growth next year. Um, and we'll see. There, there, there will be the market conditions that drive strong economic growth, and then, of course, policies in Washington, D.C. Um, I think a lot of folks are focusing on the, the special elections in Georgia. Those are going to have a big impact from a policy perspective on where things head. Um, so there's a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of dynamics at work right now, um, but, but, I, but I do think we are seeing a rebalancing of the markets from the period of April through June that was just very difficult. Uh, very, very interesting. Appreciate your comments on that, looking at that, you know, how we rolled into the situation with an oversupply, which has trickled down into this, you know, but, but as we're balancing out with demand, it gives us a lot of hope. So appreciate that perspective. Um, I have one, we have time for one last question and what I'm, you know, we do have and have a lot of conversation around large oil and natural gas businesses that operate in Louisiana and the Gulf of Mexico. But Louisiana also has a lot of small and medium sized businesses that are the indirect um, beneficiary of those investments by companies here in the state in the OCS. When you're talking about the outlook going forward being positive, do you consider any of the stimulus talks? 
um, you know, as we have businesses that are potentially on the verge of going under, um, you know, what kind of hope, what kind of um, resources, anything that you can think of as you're going into that projected higher demand, is there any stimulus as part of that from the government? I know there's been stalemates most recently. Yeah, that's a great question, Tyler. At the at the outset, um, you know, we, we had taken the position really uh, during the CARES Act that, you know, we supported uh, economic stabilization. We thought it was absolutely essential um, during the during the pandemic. Um, and what we were most concerned as an oil and gas trade, obviously, we were most concerned that the available programs, either through Treasury, the Federal Reserve, or, um, you know, directly through Congress, through other authorizations or appropriations, were fairly allocated across U.S. businesses and were not discriminated, and that industries were not discriminated, specifically ours. And, and to the credit of Congress and the administration, that was the case. And we expect that to be the case continuing. Um, it appears that the, the recovery to some degree has stalled in part because of the lack of uh, stimulus. There's no question that it, this sort of, it's been sort of a forcing event, both the economic numbers as well as jobs numbers, as well as the rise in, in cases. Um, has been a forcing mechanism on Congress, and you see, so you see, um, the administration and Congress has kind of sped up what was thought to be um, negotiations that had um, been sidelined. I know yesterday, Senator Schumer and McConnell were back and forth on, you know, what appears to be, though they're big issues, two stumbling blocks: one on the Republican side and one on the Democratic side to additional stimulus, but. I, I think there's no question that the 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 volume, so to speak, of folks pushing for additional economic stimulus has increased significantly in Washington, D.C. over the last couple of weeks. And I think that's perhaps has changed the trajectory of the legislation, which most folks had thought what might be um, impossible pre-Biden administration. I think it's changed the political dynamic. Now, coming into a new administration on top of whatever gets passed, I think you can expect that Senate, that uh, President-elect Biden is going to be, uh, when he's, when he's, ele when he's inaugurated, is, is in the, in the new Congress is really going to push for, for, for his own programs, for his own stimulus, and also potentially try to tie authorizing policy to that to that to those funding we're, we're that's something that we're going to watch very closely um you know we're, we're obviously going to be uh, going about making sure that our industry again is not uh is not harmed through that legislation but also that our priorities are protected during that period but you know i would expect even if there's a push for stimulus now that that you could see additional stimulus down the road and that's just the, the last point i think that's why you see the 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 president elect talking about um talking about how difficult this winter is going to be um, he's you know even though you have news about the vaccine and more positive signs you see this incoming administration not downplaying it but sort of giving a giving a picture of how difficult this this winter could be Interesting. Um, well, we look forward to those continued conversations and hopefully improve the economics in Louisiana. And again, really appreciate your time today to provide insight. Um, for those of you all that don't know, LaMoga and API work very closely and we have a, and pe people like Gifford Briggs, the Gulf Coast Region Director who helped coordinate this. We really appreciate his time in, in getting this, this together. So to Frank, thank you very much. Gifford, thank you for, for set, helping set this up. And with that, I will turn it over to Mark. Thank you, Tyler. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Tyler. And I uh, want to thank again, Representative Kuzan and Senator Hewitt. Uh, the one message we've heard today is uh, that if we speak up as an industry and participate in the process and tell the people we've elected um, what we think, that it can make a difference. And the last message we want to leave everyone with uh, in 2020, or really two messages, number one, um, we're grateful for you 
and we're grateful for the, the support that everybody working in oil and gas provides the industry. Um, and we're hopeful for um, growth and recovery in 2021. And, and so thanks to everybody um, who makes up the Grow Louisiana Coalition and Louisiana's oil and gas industry for the work that you do every day. Um, we're proud to be a part of what you do. The, the second part is next year, as always, but maybe more important than, than many years prior, is a year for us to speak up as an industry, as the people of the industry, so that we can make a difference in the things that we can control. Um, things like the coastal lawsuits and changing that for the better so that our industry can get more investment in Louisiana. Speaking up for the things we need economically to recover um, from the challenges of 2020 and the challenges that may come so that the small and mid-sized businesses in the industry um, can continue to fulfill their, in, in, their important obligations to the industry and their contributions to the industry um, and things we can do to attract more investment in the state. So Merry Christmas to everyone on behalf of the Grow, Grow Louisiana Coalition. Thank you for being a part of the Powering Ahead uh, webinar series and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you.